Welcome to Green Lake Church. We're delighted that you can join us via the meanings of electronics in worship this morning. Here in Seattle today, the sun is shining. It is a beautiful day. We hope that wherever you are, here locally in Seattle or around the world, we hope that the sun of God's love will light your heart as we spend time in worship here together this morning. To begin our worship service, we have our Minister of Music, Wanda Griffiths, with the prelude. Wanda? Good morning. Welcome back to Green Lake Church at Worship on Sabbath morning. We're so delighted that you can join us. We have a number of community items to share together this morning. And let me start with birthdays. We have a number of them. So I think today is the birthday of Burl Longway. Happy birthday, Burl. Uh, hope you have a good one. Then we have this week, Jennifer Maroa. Happy birthday to you, Jennifer. Anna Cyberlick, hey Annie girl, happy birthday to you. And Brian Harris, I hope you're not out hiking on a mountain today. Happy birthday to you when your birthday arrives this week. And Charlene Morrow, Charlene, happy birthday this week. Sherry Roberts, happy birthday to you. And Tavita Tuatelli, happy birthday, Tivo. To all of you who, had, who are having birthdays this week, Happy birthday to you. We're delighted that you're part of our family. We wish you every blessing in the year to come in your life. And then one other birthday item that I want to mention this morning. Next Sabbath, July 25, is the 98th birthday of Twyla Lyman. And her family is requesting, her friends are requesting, I'm requesting, those of you who know her, send her a birthday card. Uh, her address is uh, mentioned in the bulletin. Send her a birthday card and uh, let's rally around her that way. We can't get together in person. We can't have a big cake and blow out the candles, but we can connect with one another. So uh, next Sabbath, we'll, we'll wish a rich happy birthday to Twyla. Oh boy, I guess this comes right after wishing we could be together to say happy birthday to one another. Um, the worship committee, the church board, church and business session, of, you know, in different groups, we have been processing the question of gathering again in person inside the building here at church. And at this point, 
our decision is that we will not gather inside the building in person until stage four. And obviously that means we don't know when we'll be gathering again inside the building. We had discussed the idea of having some smaller gatherings on the front lawn of the church. Um, and we've been hesitant to do that because we assume that a church gathering will mean a bunch of church families with a bunch of little kids. And we are not optimistic about our ability to persuade a bunch of little kids to be properly decorous and socially distance themselves. Uh, on the other hand, we do encourage you if there are smaller groups of adults in the church who would like to gather outside, we encourage you to do that. That seems to be the lowest risk way of socializing. Get together, maintain distance, but do it outside where the breeze is blowing and the sun is shining. Uh, it is sure nice to get together when we can. Just yesterday, I met Tad Ishikawa and his daughter Charlotte in the parking lot in Bellevue to exchange some items for worship. And we kept distance and we wore masks, but it was really nice to see real live people in person and not just on the screen. So let's find ways to stay in touch as we continue to be prudent and careful in managing our way through this pandemic. Ah, Wanda, Wanda Griffiths, our Minister of Music, has a couple of music notes for us. So I turn it over to you, Wanda. Thank you. I wanted to tell you a little bit about the music that's happening today. Uh, we have some recordings pulled from uh, a previous service. Uh, the very talented Takumi Taguchi is going to be playing both for the offering music and for the um, special music time. The family is a longtime um, friends, longtime connection with the Ishikawa family. And so we're very blessed that uh, we've had the opportunity to uh, hear Takumi in, in our worship and uh, the family offered us a video, pardon me, offered us a video that we will be listening to for the offering that was actually recorded at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia. Uh, Takumi has been um, studying with uh, the chief violinist of the Seattle Symphony and uh, may still be studying, but he's also at that age where he's expanding out into uh, um, um, The second video you will have him is accompanied by Charlotte Pawa and comes from the uh, January 2019, one of our worships. Um, such a gifted young man. So we're grateful to be able to share that uh, again and listen to it. And then during this time of pandemic, um, we have only been using piano for prelude and postlude. And this week for the first time, we will be having a postlude shared that um, Gumi came and recorded at Green Lake with me this week. So recording an organ takes very good equipment, somebody who really knows what they're doing with placement, with uh, microphone, with equalization. And so we have not been sharing organ recordings from the prior services because the ways those were recorded did not show the instrument off to its best um, in its best light. Plus there's a lot of ambient noise and, and that kind of thing. So I'm so pleased that Gumi was willing to come and record several pieces with me this week. And we were very careful and we stayed away and wore our masks, um, but it will be a, a nice opportunity for you to get to hear the organ um, live as best we can in this circumstance. So uh, I hope you appreciate and enjoy that. The piece is called Fanfare for a New Day. And with all the, the gloom and doom, we want to be lifting up encouragement and hope for a future um, that is looking better than the future we're feeling right now. So back to you, John. Thanks, Wanda. I'm really looking forward to hearing it again. Gumi shared the recording with me earlier and it was a wonderful recording um, and love the music. So thanks so much to both you and Gumi for providing that for us. Want to remind you that we do have uh, printed materials uh, in connection with Sabbath School available here through the church. You can just let us know and we'll make sure we get them to you. We have quarterlies and various Sabbath School papers, especially the junior guide. I know a number of you really like that one for the kids. So just let us know and we'll make sure we get them to you. Oh, 
Uh, on August 15, we're planning a special service and uh, Gumi is going to tell us about it. So Gumi, I turn it over to you. I can't speak in my language. So on uh, August 15, we want to get you involved. So if anybody speaks a different language, uh, we'd like to get your part, be part of the church, saying something in your language, happy Sabbath, or, you know, a greeting or goodbye, or, and, and something creative, uh, even reading something. Uh, we want to see all the flavors that we have uh, within our church. I'm going to share a quick video with you, and let's see how that goes. Hello, so before we start our video, I want you to take the phone, grab it like this and turn it. Oh, it's hard to turn it. But let's videotape ourselves in landscape mode. Now before you start recording, hit the record button. Be sure that you have nicely framed in the screen. And then count to five in your mind. One, two, three. And then look at the camera so you have a little bit of headroom when you start recording because I will trim it down and then I like to see how many voices we have that speak different languages. Now so we could say Golan Dayin, Glealan Quiltadag, good morning, happy Sabbath. Or at the end maybe have like two messages, a beginning message and the end message that we can put together in a video saying you know bless bless um or however you say that, you know, in your language. In Icelandic, it's bless. Eða verið sæl. Well, um, thank you for taking the time to record some videos and share as many as we can, because it would be fun to get as many languages as we can in there. We miss seeing each other, and what an excuse to have a face and a smile that we miss. Uh, thank you again ahead of time. We hope to see as many videos as we can on August 15th, which is kind of an international Sabbath. If you're just saying hello, goodbye, or happy Sabbath, or reading a text in your language, uh, that'd be awesome. So look forward to see what we can come up with. Bye-bye. Also, after you say goodbye, make a little bit of space, count to five or ten, before you turn it off the camera. See, bye bye. Thanks, Gumi. Uh, appreciate that. So that's International Sabbath, August 15. Hope that you can, uh, if you have uh, some national heritage outside the United States, that you could share some of that with us. I know we have people from many nations, many places uh, who come together to worship and fellowship here at Green Lake Church. We love to highlight that on our international Sabbaths. One more announcement I'd like to share with you. Um, you know, during this, this crazy time of COVID, there's also been an enormous amount of economic dislocation. I've heard numbers that suggest that 20 to 30% of Americans have had trouble making their monthly housing payment, whether that's a mortgage payment or a rent payment uh, during the month of uh, July. If you're facing some special challenges and you need some special help, let us know. We do have some funds here at church that are designed especially to help our church members. And so if you're having a hard time, please let us know. Let's see if there's a way that we can get you some help. You know, we, we worship together. And that's, that's central in our life. But we also seek to be a, a genuine, an authentic community where we help to carry each other, to hold each other, and help each other through these hard times. So if we can be of help, please let us know. You can give me a call. You can leave a message at the church. Uh, you can send an email. But be in touch with us if there's some way that we as a congregation can be of help. Now it's time for our morning hymn all things bright and beautiful and what a lovely hymn for such a beautiful day as this here in seattle
Let's pray together. Creator of earth and sky and sea, maker of rocks and birds and trees, thank you for calling us into your presence this morning and receiving us with your smile. Lord of the nations, we pray that you will hasten the day when swords are turned into plowshares and spears are turned into pruning hooks and justice rolls down like the great river. Lord of the seasons, we pray that you will take us quickly through this season of distress, of disease and economic uncertainty and bring us again soon to a better place. Lord of our hearts, we pray that you will work in us and through us, make us partners with you in advancing the cause of your kingdom. May we be your agents in the week to come, accomplishing justice and peace. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And now it's time for the offering. Today's offering is for local ministries. The irony of a local offering call from the other side of the Pacific is not lost on me. But I am grateful that one of the ministries GreenLake has supported all along is the streaming church services. While we cannot gather as a family, the church still has ministries to support. From the basics of utility bills and maintenance, to personnel and local outreach, they all need financial support. Please give generously as you are able. Dear God, please bless the offerings donated here and around the world. Use them, multiply them, direct them for the good of all.
Good morning, children. How are you doing with these pandemic stay-at-home rules? Is it a little boring? Did you know that the state of Oregon has a town called Boring? And in fact, the welcome sign says, the most exciting place to be. My parents used to live close to this town and I think it's a pretty nice town. Well, there's a chicken that lives in this town and this chicken was bored too and decided to go visiting its neighbors. Well, the nice couple who lived next door found an egg. You can see here, I have to look carefully, there's an egg. It was by the front porch. How did an egg get outside their living room window? Well, they finally found out. Right here was a chicken. And that's how they got to know Betty, the entertainer. Well, Betty has a nice farm where she lives. She lives with goats and other chickens and turkeys and plenty of food and green grass and bugs. It's a really nice place to live, but Grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. And so, but wait, how did Betty get over the fence? Chickens don't normally fly. Well, now the couple had proof. They knew that Betty was unique and she'd figured out how to fly over that fence. So they provided her some delicious chicken feed and a snack that was always there for her. And she was faithful every day. Well, except she wasn't reliable. Sometimes she'd show up at 8 a.m. and go over to her little nest. Other times she'd be there at 10 a.m. and she would go sit on the nest for about 30 minutes. And after 30 minutes, this would happen. is reminded that even during the scary and boring pandemic, God is faithful too. The Bible says, great is your faithfulness, O God. Your compassions are new every morning. Betty has had many adventures while visiting the neighbors. She rules the roost and among others, she's met a raccoon, a skunk, Let's see how she dealt with this encounter. imagine Betty's gotten lots of visitors, people who want to see a chicken come and lay an egg. Even when times are scary, God reminds us how much he cares. And the Bible says, with his feathers, we are covered. And under his wings, we find safety. I like how God uses birds to remind us about his care. Thanks to Gumi for bringing pretty Betty into action. And thanks for the couple for sharing the reminder that this plucky chicken brings to them about how God cares. I'm sure each of you have stories, which I look forward to hearing in person sometime soon. Pretty Betty, the entertainer. 
Might be in a hurry running home, but you can depend she will be back tomorrow. Dear God, we pray for wisdom for ourselves, our family, and our community. Help us to discern your path for our lives. We also pray for compassion and understanding. Let our tongue soothe and not denigrate. Help us to be an example to those around us. We pray for health. Heal our body and our minds and give us the stamina to continue in the face of hardship. Help us to reach out to those around us with a helping hand and a caring heart. We pray for mercy for ourselves when we come up short, and we pray for a merciful heart to pass on the same generosity you bestow on us to those we come in contact with. We pray fervently for the chance to gather again, to travel again, to see our family and friends again, wherever and whoever they may be. And we pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. The Old Testament reading is from Genesis 13, verse 1 to 4. So Abraham left Egypt and traveled north into Negev, along with his wife and Lot and all that they owned. Abraham was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. From Negev, they continued traveling by stages toward Bethel, and they pitched their tents between Bethel and Ai, where they had camped before. This was the same place where Abraham built the altar, and there he worshipped the Lord again.
The New Testament reading is from Luke 16, verse 19 to 25. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his side. So he called to them, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and said, Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while well, Lazarus received bad things, but now he is confronted here and you are in agony. May the Lord bless the hearing of the word. The New Testament reading and the Old Testament reading raise an interesting contrast. In the Old Testament, we read that Abraham was a man of great wealth. Then Jesus tells a story, and the point of the story is warning about the, the folly of wealth. And the hero in that story is a man named Lazarus who is pictured at the end of the story as hanging out with Abraham. So you're going, wait a minute, Abraham's really, really rich. And the villain, if you will, and the story of Lazarus is really, really rich. So apparently the moral of the story is not really about being rich or not being rich. It must be something else. So now I'm gonna take us back to the story of Abraham, and we'll begin with our scripture reading that was read for us a little earlier. Abraham had been down in Egypt, got into some messes there. Now he's headed back toward the land of Canaan. He heads north out of the Negev, heading up into the land of Canaan. And the text says that Abraham was very rich. He had lots of sheep and goats and cattle and silver. And as he traveled north from uh, out of the Negev, the southern, uh, that peninsula down south, he travels north. He's traveling in the hill country of what later would be called the hill country of Judea. And everywhere he goes, he, when they stop for a while, he builds an altar. He, he builds a place of worship and he keeps alive his, his awareness of God's involvement in his life, even while he is intensely engaged in his work of taking care of all the people and all the animals that are under his uh, leadership. And he has with him his nephew Lot. And the text says that Lot also was very, very wealthy. Apparently this household was, was in fact hundreds and hundreds of people, perhaps a thousand people. And so we can imagine a, a tent encampment somewhere um, with a number of tents, Abraham's tent, and there would be other tents around him. And then in, a, in a, a radiating circle way out beyond that for miles, there would have been the encampments of various herdsmen and cowboys with the animals, which would need to be moved from pasture to pasture to pasture, from watering place to watering place to keep from overwhelming the resources of the land. But the text says, even with all this movement, it was not a sustainable arrangement. And the problem in this case was not environmental constraints because they were already moving, keeping the sheep, the goats, the cows moving. So they didn't overgraze, didn't uh, destroy the place that they were eating. The problem was it was socially unsustainable because you had two bosses, Abraham, and Lot, and they got along, but their people began to get into squabbles because Lot's cowboys wanted their cows to be in a particular lush area, and Abraham's cowboys are going, no, 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 that place is for us, you got to move on, and they would get into fights, 
finally news of this conflict reaches Abraham and Lot and they sit down to solve the problem. Abraham says, look, you know, we're, we're family. There's no point in us fighting or our people fighting and they're going to do it. We, we can't stop them from doing it if we keep them so closely together. We need to separate. You go north, I'll go south. You go south, I'll go north. You pick where you want to go and I'll go elsewhere. Let, let's, let's split our, our, our people apart. Let's get our herds and our cowboys and our shepherds way apart so there won't be conflict. So we can remain friends as well as family. A lot agrees to do it. He looks out and looks down out of the hill country where they were toward the lush valley of the Jordan down near the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, I think I'd like that. And Abraham says, fine. So they split up. Lot headed uh, down the hill east uh, toward the lush pastures near the Jordan. And Abraham stayed in the uh, hill country uh, around uh, Bethel. The next part of the story to me is intriguing. Abraham and Lot separate. Lot chooses what looks like to be lusher, well, it was lusher pasturage, but it was more complicated socially because it was near cities. So there was more social action to be concerned with. And after Lot had been down there in the valley for a while, sure enough, some harsh, social realities asserted themselves. And now if you don't mind, I'm going to read some of my notes from the text because there's this play on words. And this is an ancient story. And part of reading ancient stories is like reading kids books. You know, the names are part of the magic and I have not quite managed to get them confidently memorized. So I'm going to read them. All right. About this time, war broke out in the area, and there were several kings on one side, King Amraphel of Babylonia, King Arioch of Elisar, King Ketaleomer of Elam, and King Tidal of Goim. Wouldn't you like a name like Ketaleomer? Or maybe you could name your chicken that. Yeah, instead of Betsy Jana, we could call the chicken Ketaleomer but I think that sounds like a rooster name, not like a hen name. Anyway, these four kings, Amraphel, Arioch, Ketoleomer, and Tidal, got into a war with five kings. King Bera of Sodom, King Bersha of Gomorrah, King Shinab of Adma, and King Shemeber of Zeboim Bela, plus one more. And the reason they got into a war is because the first set of kings, had conquered the area around Sodom and Gomorrah and made them subject territories. And Sodom and Gomorrah had paid tribute for 12 years. Then they got tired of paying those taxes, so they rebelled. And in the 13th year, let me run through my names again. In the 13th year, Amraphel of Babylonia and Arioch of Elisar, Kedoleomer of Elam and Tidal of Goim, came and attacked Bera of Sodom and King Bersha of, Gomer of Gomorrah and King Shanab of Adma and King Shamiber of Zeboim Bela. There was a war. And unfortunately for Lot, his, the, the people where he lived, they lost the war and they hauled off all the wealth, and all the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, taking it back up north toward Elisar and Babylonia. Somebody escaped and came and told Abraham what had happened. Abraham, Abraham, the kings came, they attacked, they, they conquered, they took everybody away, including your nephew Lot and his wife and family. Now you could think that Abraham might have thought, wow, four kings, that's a huge force. What can I do? 
he had only 318 soldiers in his household. And then he had other uh, people, local people, that he was uh, allied with, Mamre, Eshkol, and Aner. They were all relatives. Uh, they were Philistines or Canaanites. But still, they were just a small group of people. You could almost imagine Abraham saying, boy, Lot was not too smart settling down there near Sodom. He should have stayed somewhere in the hill country where he would have been safer. But Abraham did not say that. Abraham said, my people are in trouble. I better do something. And so he got his 318 men together. He got his neighbors, Mamre, Anar, and Eshkol, and they took off after Lot and their captors. They attacked at night, surprised the army, chased them all off, and rescued all the people and brought everybody back to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a pretty amazing victory. Now, once they got back to Sodom and Gomorrah, the, there's more drama. A mysterious king shows up, a man named Melchizedek, king of Salem. And Salem is Jerusalem. There's no introduction. We don't know why he was there. All we know is that King Melchizedek of Salem shows up at this victory uh, party. The Bible also tells us that he was a priest. And then Abraham, in recognition of the fantastic victory he had won, Abraham's thinking, this was a miracle. God has given me a victory. He gives 10% of the spoils that he had gotten in this enterprise. He gives 10% to Melchizedek because Melchizedek is a representative of God. Well, at that point, the king of Sodom and says, Abraham, look, every, you can take all the stuff. Just give us the people. But, but you know, you won all the loot in a war, fair and square. You take all the, the loot you want. Uh, just give me the people and we'll rebuild our, our place and rebuild our, our lives together here. But Abraham says, oh, no, 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 no. I will not take a thing because I don't want you to be able to say I made Abraham rich. He said, no. Now, my allies who came with me, Mamre, Anar, and Eshkol, they should get something for their labor. But me, no. I don't want anything. I don't need anything. As I, as I read through this story of Abraham and compared it with our New Testament reading that talked about the folly of trusting in wealth, I thought, what lesson can we take from this? What, what's the moral of the story for us? One of the things that jumped out at me is when we look at the Old Testament and some of the famous people there, people like Abraham and Job and Moses and Solomon, one thing they all had in common is they were wealthy, powerful people. When you go to the New Testament, you have somebody like Lazarus who is poor and lowly, has nothing and the New Testament makes it clear that God is on the side of those poor people, those little people who need help. Jesus came to help the little people. His special focus was the little people. So how do we connect that with these stories from the Old Testament, where God's best friends, it seems, are really, really rich people, people like Abraham and Job. You know, the Bible says Abraham was very wealthy, and Job was very, very very well. Job was a billionaire. <laughs> he, he really had an enormous amount of wealth. So how do we put together the picture of these men as the friends of God and then the stories of Jesus where God is paying special attention to the, the little people, the poor people? I think the answer is pretty clear here when we look at how Abraham interacted with Lot. What did Abraham do with his wealth? He made his wealth a platform for serving and for helping. We see his magnanimity in the way that he related to his nephew. Abraham could have easily said, well, Lot, you know, the country's getting too small for us. You need to take off. But he didn't do that. Abraham was so secure in his wealth that he could take care of his nephew because Abraham's going, I'm good. I can do, 
I can take whatever part of the country is left over because I have all I need. I have enough. And then when Lot got himself into trouble, Abraham said, I have the power to do something to make it better. And he did. And then you have the constant references of Abraham's worship of God. And the picture is that Abraham understood wealth as one of the ways that he was a partner with God. The Bible paints the picture of God as the, the owner of the cattle on a thousand hills. All of creation belongs to God. And what does God do with that wealth? That wealth becomes the platform for service. God serves the lowly. He serves the hungry. He serves the needy. He pays attention to the disadvantaged. And when Abraham and Job, as wealthy, powerful men, saw themselves in connection with God, they saw themselves as partners with God in that kind of service. They were so much partners that they got into arguments with God. Now, Job lost his argument with God. Abraham, uh, you could say he kind of won his argument with God. And we'll, we'll encounter that story later where he argued with God trying to save Sodom from destruction. But the point is that both of these men had a sense of partnership with God that was real enough that they could engage God almost as a peer or a colleague. And God honored that. They are respected for that kind of engagement with God. Which brings it to us. What are we going to do with the wealth that is in our hands? If we choose to do so, the wealth that is in our hands can become part of our friendship, our partnership with God. And we can argue with God too, just like Abraham and Job did. We can argue with God as somebody who will hear us and somebody who is engaged with us and participates with us because we are participating in his mission. After all, we come to those words of Jesus in Matthew 5, where Jesus says, God sends his rain and his sunshine on the just and the unjust. God is magnanimous. And when we are magnanimous, we are acting like God. As an old man, I'm often looking at the kids in our church, and forgive me, because sometimes when I use the word kids, I'm thinking of the little children there on the platform in church doing children's story, you know, three years old and four years old and six years old. And sometimes when I think kids, I'm thinking about people who shouldn't be called kids anymore, young adults, who are making their life and making careers and you're making a difference in the world. You know, like any grandfather, when I look at young people, I'm dreaming of the great things you can do. I'm hoping that you will become powerful and influential and wealthy. And that will, you will use that power and influence and wealth in partnership with God to make the world a better place. One of the ways that we can can nourish the nobility of our souls and prepare ourselves for ongoing partnership with God is through spiritual practice. It's what we do by gathering in church. And here we're gathering virtually, but we, we listen to music, we listen to scripture, we tell stories, we listen to sermons. We do that to nourish our souls and to encourage ourselves in the practice of magnanimity, generosity, and nobility. We want to be partners with God. And in worship, we prepare ourselves for that kind of partnership. I had friends when I, uh, that uh, had, well, they were my youth teacher when I was a teenager back in church in Memphis. And they ended up in Walla Walla. And sometimes when I went to Walla Walla, I would stay at their house. And every morning at their house, we would have breakfast together. And along with food for breakfast, every day they would have a daily reading. I believe that the reading they used was called Our Daily Bread. It was a devotional reading that's been in print for something like 75 years. But every morning they spent a few minutes sharing those inspirational words together to nourish their soul, to fuel their hope, to inspire their moral vision. 
And I want to encourage us to do that. Let's make sure, like Abraham, everywhere he went, he built an altar. We see him engaged in noble, godlike activity, rescuing the needy. Let's make sure we are nourishing our soul. We are engaging in spiritual practices that will connect our hearts with God, that will open our minds and hearts to God's inspiration and guidance and prepare us to be rich and powerful and righteous, to be wealthy, happy, and holy. And now it's time for our closing hymn. One of the wonders of technology is that uh, we can interact with each other remotely. And I've got a text already about this morning's sermon saying, but what, what if we don't have wealth or we don't have the wealth that we used to have? It's a good question. And I'll try to address it more fully in a future sermon. But I, I think I need to underline this, that when we use the word wealth, we're talking about something that we have, we have control of. And for some of us, that is money. For some of it's status. For some of us, it's something very small. We don't have much. 
And I think the call on us is to simply look at what we do have, the life and breath that God has given us, and ask, how can I use this today to honor God and to touch humanity? For some of us, we have large reach, large scope of action. For some, it's very, very small. But I think that question, what can I do with the life that is in my hand today? That's the question that will guide us and provide help in our daily living. Now, I thank you for joining us. Um, let's have the benediction now. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us here at Green Lake Church today for worship. Pray that as you go into the week to come, that you will go with God, you will work with God, you will be kept by God. And now, our Minister of Music, Wanda Griffith, has a new postlude for us. Wanda, thank you. Thank you.